And good morning, I'm Pastor Kendall Shelter. Welcome to Providence Valley and Grace Lutheran Church's weekly uh, worship broadcast on KLQP Radio and also on our YouTube channel. It's good to be with you uh, this morning. We're thankful our radio and online worship broadcasts are given in honor of Noah Borstead's baptismal anniversary today from Tim and Ann Borstead. Noah was baptized in 1981, so we celebrate with them, their family and also thank them for sponsoring our, our weekly worship broadcast. And then the bulletins that we have in our hand today are given in memory of Tim Lee's birthday on October 23rd by Bob and Marlene Lee. So uh, thank you for that memorial gift and, and sponsoring our, our worship bulletins this morning for our worship time together. Uh, we have uh, just a, a few announcements to make for our activities going on this week at at Grace uh, at uh, 3.15 on uh, Wednesday, our fifth grade first communion class will continue. We met last week. We'll meet one more uh, time preparing our fifth graders for first communion. And then at six o'clock, we're gonna ask the parents to come in and meet for, for a short meeting uh, with, their, with their child. So again, that's Wednesday at six o'clock, a parent in our fifth grade first communion class meeting. Our ninth grade confirmation class will meet at six o'clock on Wednesday as well, and they're gonna be here to help with our trick-or-treating for the food shelf this year. Uh, uh, trick-or-treating for the food shelf is gonna look a little different this year. We're gonna have a drive-through donation uh, experience for you. So if you uh, come by the church on 8th Street, so right by the office doors, the glass doors, one of our ninth graders will meet you in your vehicle and they'll be happy to um, take your donation to the food shelf. Our, our food shelf is in need to have some of their, uh, 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 the, the shelves restocked. Um, the the uh, utilization of the food shelf has been high these last weeks, and, and so we really need to restock those shelves, and we're hoping that you'll uh, help out with that. So again, on Wednesday from six to seven, all you have to do is drive by on 8th Street, by uh, the office doors and our ninth graders will take your contribution. So uh, thank you in advance uh, for your generosity. Uh, that's the best that we can do this year for uh, trick-or-treating for the food, food shelf, but we hope it will be a success. Also, we wanna uh, offer our continued prayers to the Teresa Funker family. Her funeral was held at Faith Lutheran in Madison yesterday, and then also uh, we ask for prayers for Brett Stratmore. Uh, Brett uh, is undergoing uh, surgery. He uh, suffered a farm accident this past week and is having surgery in Sioux Falls, and so we ask for your prayers for healing for Brett and, and, uh, and uh, also um, uh, for all the uh, doctors and surgeons that are caring for him at this time. So thank you uh, for that. We, uh, um, again, are thankful that you're joining us here at Providence and Grace for our worship time, and we'll begin worship together. So blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who creates, redeems, and sustains us and all of creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. A faithful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We turn from your loving embrace and go our own ways. We pass judgment on one another before examining ourselves. We place our own needs before those of our neighbors. We keep your gift of salvation to ourselves. Make us humble, cast away our transgressions, and turn us again to life in you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And you, know, you may be seated uh, for our Kyrie and our, our hymn of praise. <laughs> i 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And then let us pray together our prayer of the day this morning. O Lord God, you are the holy lawgiver. You are the salvation of your people. By your Spirit, renew us in your constant of covenant of love and train us to care tenderly for all our neighbors through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on God's law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregations of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from Leviticus chapter 19. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of people in Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I the Lord your God am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With injustice you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart any one of your kin. You shall reprove your neighbor, or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against any of your people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. The word of the Lord. Our gospel this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 36. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Scribe, actually. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, 
sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. The Gospel of our Lord. I'm going to be a little different today and preach from over here. My, my head mic is not working very well. So, Grace and peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have pictures today. Maybe. Guess what? We are still in the Tuesday of Holy Week in this scripture today. This is week five in a row, friends. Important things are happening here at the end of chapter 21 and all through chapter 22 of Matthew's Gospel. At the beginning of chapter 21, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and then proceeds to the temple and starts turning over tables like he owns the place. The religious authorities are not sure what to make of this guy who the crowds celebrate as a great prophet. So throughout each of the scenes in these chapters, as Jesus dwells among the crowd in Jerusalem, men representing the various religious authorities keep approaching Jesus and they challenge him with questions about church law. Pretty obvious that they want to trap Jesus into saying something that will allow them to have him arrested. Um, But with every new question, we see Jesus completely school these scholars on the scripture and use parables to illustrate to them, uh, the disciples and the crowds, what should actually happen in practical situations when religious law is challenged. In the verses of chapter 22, we are given this week, a scribe, or our version said a lawyer, sent by the Pharisees um, to Jesus is sent with yet another question. What is the greatest commandment of the law, in the law? The law. Remember, Jews only use the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament, as their religious text. Are my 7th and 8th grade confirmation students paying attention? We're studying the Old Testament this year and just talked about this. See, friends, it's relevant. So the Jews, which includes Jesus, by the way, have the entire Hebrew Bible, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, are called the Torah. And Torah both describes the history of God's relationship with God's chosen people, and outlines the detail, in detail how the faithful should go about their lives in order to be considered holy and worthy of God's favor. This is a pretty big question the scribe is asking. And Jesus' response to a question about what is the greatest out of all this law is pretty important, right? Yes. Now his answer is actually not new or mind-blowing to the people of his time. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, this is basic. We, it would have come as no surprise to the religious leaders. We just heard the neighbor bit ourselves in our Uh, second reading today from Leviticus chapter 19. And then to love God above all else is the first of the commandments given to Moses back in Exodus chapter 20. Neither of these should be news to us any more than it was to Jesus' audience in Jerusalem. What Jesus says next is where you and I really have to pay attention. Jesus names the two commandments and then declares... On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. All the law and the prophets. Jesus says loving God and loving our neighbor are the number one takeaways from the entire Hebrew Bible. Jesus names these two commandments. And many of us will receive that as being separate ideas. 
Um, if you've been taught that God is completely separate entity that floats around in heaven, then this interpretation of Jesus makes sense, except that God isn't fully separate. We believe in a triune God, creator, Christ, spirit. The creator formed humans from the dust and breathed life into us. God's fingerprints are all over every created thing. Things and beings God calls good. The Christ is standing in flesh and blood speaking these words, both to the people of Jerusalem and then through the living document of scripture to us today. Jesus, the Christ, promises that when he is no longer walking in easily recognizable human skin, he will leave with the disciples, with us, an advocate. We call this form of God, the Holy Spirit. And at the resurrection, Jesus breathes the Holy Spirit onto the disciples, the same breath that was already breathed into life at the time of creation. God is here and now, always. God is not off floating somewhere, but is present in every cell of the body. When Jesus says to love God and love neighbor, He's not talking about two different acts of love. We show our love to God by showing love to our neighbor because God is our neighbor. I'm going to challenge you a bit today. Maybe what I have said so far already feels a little challenging even though I, I hope not. It's okay to feel challenged. Uh, maybe don't tune me out because you're uncomfortable, though, okay? Because we really need to have a think about what it means to love our neighbor in our context today, and it needs to not just come from me. I'm going to stand and share my thoughts, and then you will need to digest that and find your truth in it. So I ask, who is our neighbor? I've been wrestling with this question not just this past week, but definitely this week, uh, because my literal neighbors here in Dawson are still new to me. Who is our neighbor? I thought about Grace's food shelf. I mean, you're all familiar, right? It's right in the middle of the first floor education wing, open Tuesdays, one to four. Perhaps you've donated items or money before. Maybe you've even worked a shift. Or maybe that's not even on your radar, that's okay. Now you know it's a thing. The food shelf is an amazing service that your church community offers, and I commend your support of it. Do you know who you support through this food ministry, though? Why do these neighbors need to visit? Are they just lazy bums in need of a free handout? Do they work hard, but pay from jobs that are available just doesn't cover their needs? Does the selection available at our food shelf fill their needs? Are there certain items that maybe they wish we had more consistently or even something special to them specifically that never appears on the shelf? Over the past month, I've seen some of the people, our neighbors, show up week after week. I'll admit, I haven't been so proactive as to rush down the hall to introduce myself. And the story I've told myself is that this inaction is out of respect for the anonymity of their need and not because I'm not interested in knowing them. And the first bit is hogwash. I am uncomfortable with the possibility of entering an awkward situation and really need to get over myself and meet my neighbors. In meeting my neighbors at the food shelf, on my street, in the broader community, in the process of meeting and getting to know them, they become real to me. Suddenly, now I have a flesh and bone sibling in Christ who has the same needs as I do. It's scary though, right? That realness of knowing, because when I really know my neighbor and it's Chelsea and it's Chris and it's the Knutsons instead of just the anonymous people who live in those houses near mine, I'm suddenly confronted with a sense of responsibility for their well-being. And if that responsibility isn't held up on my end, now I'm feeling a little guilty. Ignorance is bliss, right? Um, not knowing is so much easier. Knowing my neighbors means I cannot pretend 
as though they do not exist. Knowing my neighbors means their joy and celebration is mine, and their struggle and sorrow is also my own. Another example, traveling is a thing that brings me great joy. And when there's an opportunity to travel to a new place, paired with an opportunity for ministry, I get even more excited. Since college, I've been on a few mission trips, one to Denver, Colorado, to learn about and serve their vast homeless population, another to Chicago to put on VBS for inner city youth. I've also served as a servant companion for three national youth gatherings where I worked with groups of youth and their sponsors during their service day out in the local communities. I love helping people. Each year in my synod in the Gulf Coast of Texas and Louisiana, uh, they take pilgrimages down to our sister synod in Peru. The relationship between the two synods has been built and nurtured over many years now. In 2014, I signed up, and in my mind, it was going to be like the other mission trips. We show up, spend a few days touring, spend another few days helping the local people, and then leave. Yes and no. The first part I got right. We did spend the first few days of our trip, our 10-day trip, touring. Our visit to the ancient ruins of Machu Picchu is an experience I will never forget. It's majestic. On the third day, however, tourist time was done. Our local guides drove us away from our hotel near Cusco's Market Square to a residential part of town and dropped us off at a building that blended in to the neighborhood and could have been anything, but in reality, it was the first of eight churches we were scheduled to visit. Talitha Kum is the name of this congregation, which means little girl rise in Hebrew. Women from the congregation appeared from the neighborhood, some with their children. They greeted us and welcomed us into the church building. After introductions, we were given a tour of the church, and our group had a short meeting in one of the classrooms. Then we set about various tasks. Some played with the kids, others planned a short worship service, and the rest of us helped out in the kitchen and visited with the ladies. Sharing a meal with guests is a very important piece in Peruvian culture. So as to honor the tradition but not put strain on their meager budget, our trip coordinators gave the women $50 to buy groceries. When everything was gathered, the women gave my friend and I tomatoes to cut up. And we did talk a little bit, but mostly enjoyed cooking together. Over dinner, we got to know our hosts a bit better, and the women became Marina, Gina, and Mariposa. None of these three, or any of the other women who came at worship time, are paid staff. They did not even have a part-time pastor at that time, yet the congregation lived on, and they willingly gave their time to keep it alive for their community. The women did this because their men worked long hours to provide for the family and had little time left over for serving the church. After dinner, People from all over the neighborhood started showing up in the sanctuary. Since there was no pastor for the congregation, it had been many months since any of them had received communion. So we had a full service, and one of the pastors in our group blessed and shared the body and blood of Christ with all gathered. And we sang. I can still hear the faithful voices crying out, Alabare, alabare, alabare a mi Señor. Which means praise, praise, praise to our Lord God in Spanish. When worship came to an end and the time grew near for our group to depart, we prayed together one last time and many hugs and kisses on each cheek were shared. Maria, Gina, Mary Posa stood in the doorway with their children as our van drove off and waved until we turned the corner. 
Maria, Gina, Mariposa, the people of Talitha Kum are my neighbors. We visited seven more congregations in the same way over the next week. They are all my neighbors. Our pilgrimage, I learned, was not about going to these churches filled with people living well below the poverty line just to offer them a handout. Our mission on this trip was to listen, to learn, to love, to continue building relationships with our siblings in Christ in Cusco and Lima and then to come home and share their stories. Knowing my neighbors means I cannot pretend as though they do not exist. Knowing my neighbors means their joy and celebration is mine, and their struggle and sorrow is my also my own. On Friday, I drove to Minneapolis to visit some friends, some of the amazing friends I have made at Luther Seminary. My friend Jay invited me to help her and her daughter and some other folks with a project over what is now known as George Floyd Square. I was eager to accept this invitation, especially from this friend because she's a black woman with family in that area and I have been praying fervently these past months for her for the community. When George Floyd was murdered, I was understandably upset because the circumstances of his death were unjust. As news spread and memorial became protest, I longed to be present marching up Chicago Avenue and down Lake Street, not only in protest of the injustice of George Floyd's death, but in support of my neighbors. After three years, of driving nearly daily by the memorial to Philando Castile that is a block away from Luther Seminary, three years of building relationships with my siblings of color other than white, both in and outside of classes, three years of learning the streets of the cities and coming to know them as another home. This great injustice that had ignited protest and unrest nationwide and beyond was personal because I took time to know and love that place and those people. My visit on Friday morning to build a greenhouse to protect house um, potted flowers left at the memorial on Chicago Avenue. Um, and working side by side with my friend Jay and the others gathered, those things were me loving my neighbor. It is in no way an easy task to love my neighbor in such a time as this. Pain, grief, and justice are ragged pills to choke down with my white guilt. Knowing my neighbors means I cannot pretend as though they do not exist. Knowing my neighbors means their joy and celebration is mine, and their struggle and sorrow is also my own. This is it, beloved. This is the gig we're called to as God's fearfully and wonderfully made creations. Love God, love neighbor. They are the same command. We are called, gathered, sent into the world to know and to love it as God knows and loves each of us deeply, carefully. This love business takes work and is rarely easy. Yet when we are willing to step outside of ourselves to know and love those around us, we not only have God within us, but our neighbors as well to help us along the way. Amen. So merciful God, everything in heaven and earth belongs to you. We joyfully release what you have entrusted to us. May these gifts be signs of our whole lives returned to you and dedicated to the healing and unity of all creation through Jesus Christ. Amen. And then we offer the prayers of the church. God of miracles and God of all mysteries, uh, you know the rhythms of, of life, uh, the rhythms of the sun and the moon and the stars, and, and also the rhythms of our lives. Uh, the joys and the sorrows, the challenges and the gifts, the places of pride and the places of 
shame as we attempt to show your love in the world. We pray that you would help us to trust when uh, the way before us may be sometimes unclear or, or when we are afraid of the future, we pray that you would help us to trust in you and then to stand in awe once again with your love that you offer to each and every one of us, that you who created the world also created us. So we uh, come again to you this day with our collective worries and our discouragements, worries and discouragements, uh, uh, maybe even of a government that seems to be laboring in disarray and discord. So we pray that you would bring us leaders who can earn trust and win hearts for the common good. And then also minister to our frustration and help us to see what we can offer. Lord, in your mercy, and give us wisdom about uh, the resources that we tend, our money, our time. Help us to put our treasure into things of your kingdom and help us to know how to make sacrifices for the sake of others as we love them. We pray also for those who face serious illness. We give thanks for people who work in places of healing. We ask that you sustain those burdened with daily care of another. And we ask that you wrap your tender arms around those who grieve, uh, who experience what seems like a long loneliness. Bind our community of faith more closely together so that in even greater measure that we would be Christ's hands and, and, and Christ's heart to the world around us. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for the earth also, we pray for the lands, for waters, for animals, the homes that have been devastated by recent wildfires in the west and, and hurricanes in the southeast. May what has been destroyed or harmed be renewed, that uh, the wildness of both storms and, and that all people uh, and people's lives be put back together again through the relief efforts that you send through your people. Lord, in your mercy. And we uh, thank you, Lord, uh, for your blessings, for the gift of Jesus who came to us to proclaim your love. We give you thanks for people in our lives that reflect that love for us, that reflect that love with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength, for our family, for our friends, for our congregational families. And we lift up these friends in prayer who stand in need of healing now as we lift their names to you in a time of silence. And Lord God, we also pray for hospitals and clinics that they receive the resources needed, that medical care be improved. We pray for all medical workers and nurses and physicians to be upheld in their difficult work in this time. Lord, in your mercy. And we pray for all in need, for all who suffer from the coronavirus, for all who are living with high anxiety. And we pray finally for ourselves. So hear us when we call upon you, O God, and enfold us in your loving arms and all for whom we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And then we confess uh, uh, together our faith using the words of our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor always and grant you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. peace serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.